Li Shangjing, Green Vines North. As the fading sun sets behind the mountains, I come to visit a solitary monk, his thatched hut. Fallen leaves on the ground, no sign of him. Cold clouds shroud the onward path. How many layers? I imagine him ringing the stone bell once at dusk, or leaning peacefully against his rotten staff. The infinite universe is barely a speck of dust. So after all, what point to my pretty, to my pity? loves and hates. So here we have the last of the pentasyllabic uh, Lu Xi regulated poems of Li Shangjing included in the collection. We will find more of uh, Li Shangjing's poems later on, perhaps in the heptasyllabic regulated poems section. I think that was his forte. In fact, I'm taking a quick glance now and there we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... Nine, ten poems of his are in the heptasyllabic regulated poem section, and probably just a few more in the quatrains at the end of the book. Yeah, I'm seeing, I think these are the heptasyllabic quatrains, and I'm seeing quite a few, quite a few, at least six or seven. Okay, so back to this poem. Uh, what is the topic? Uh, as almost all of the poems of Li Shangjing that we've encountered up to now, it's a very, very, very typical, very conventional topic. And uh, this is an exemplar of the sub-theme, uh, sub uh, or, or sub-genre, really, uh, searching for the hermit and not finding him at home. We've already encountered a, group, a series of poems like this. Probably the most famous one is uh, <coughs> Zhang Jian's. And they all follow a very, I think Wang Wei also had a few of these, at least one. They all follow a similar model and a similar subject matter. So the scholar official is going to visit a hermit in his mountain retreat after getting there, he finds that the hermit is not at home and uh, he despairs of finding him or of, of waiting for him and he generally leaves a note, perhaps the poem itself uh, commemorating the occasion is the note, the visiting card the scholar official leaves. In these poems, generally one of the conventions or, or one of the ideas is that even though the hermit is not at home and therefore uh, religious and intellectual conversation cannot be had Illumination is attained nevertheless, or at least a degree of illumination is achievable to the scholar official who visits, because the landscape itself, the physical surroundings, the landscape where the hermit lives, already transmits a teaching. So this is really part of, 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 of Chinese correlative thought and, and, and of their pathetic fallacy that, that appears frequently in their poems. Nature reacts to mankind and one of the ways in which it reacts to mankind is in teaching mankind the truths of a Buddhist impermanence. In these sorts of poems on not finding the hermit, generally the last couplet ends up on a philosophical note, summarizing what is the religious, the spiritual message that uh, the scholar official has um, attained, even though he wasn't able to have a conversation with a Buddhist monk or a hermit. Okay, we could say the poem has two parts. Uh, the first two couplets uh, describe the arriving and the surroundings of uh, the hermitage. The last two couplets uh, focus more on Li Shangjing's thoughts and his imagination running wild at the place that has been described in the first two couplets. So, as usual, let's take a look couplet by couplet and uh, explain whatever we might find there. Don't think the poem is too cryptic or too dark. It's pretty transparent, and uh, there are no evident or obvious allusions uh, that I can detect. As the fading sun sets behind the mountains, I come to visit a solitary monk, his thatched hut. So the first couplet, as usual, is pretty descriptive. It really locates 
it really summarizes the background in which the poem is supposed to be taking place. The title didn't clarify this, that it was just Green Vines North, so you might imagine uh, a contemplation of nature and a finding of green vines to the north. It could be, it could already, you could suppose by its uh, nature imagery, be evoking some sort of visit to a natural landscape, a mountain, a place of hermitage. But it's really the first couplet that clearly tells us what the background for the story is. Li Shangjin went to the mountains. He wanted to visit a solitary monk. He has arrived at the hut. And uh, we, we, we get the locus, although without any particular details, we don't know exactly where the mountain is or who the hermit is. We get the time of day, which is sunset. And, and this connotes the sadness, the melancholy of the end of day. This connotes also maybe the idea or the impression that Li Shangying has been all day long looking for the hermitage, and it has taken him uh, almost till nightfall to reach it. Fallen leaves on the ground, no sign of him. Cold clouds shroud the onward path. How many layers? So the poet's desire to meet with the hermit has been... Uh, thwarted. It's late, not only is it late, but any paths going on from the hut uh, which the hermit might have taken and which the poet might follow are being shrouded yeah, by cold clouds in many layers. So we're high up in the mountains. This is a misty landscape. It's night, it's cloudy, it's impossible to try to follow any traces of the monk and to see if he is maybe nearby, near the hut, somewhere. Also, the ground has no traces of him. We have fallen leaves, so this probably might be pointing towards autumn, which is the melancholy sad season, which always creates a nice melancholy background for any scholar official's uh, poem. And we have traces of the leaves, but no sign of, 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 of the monk. And, and, you know, this could be read also with slightly religious overtones. There are no traces of the monk. There are no traces of the doctrine of the... Uh, desired illumination that was supposed to be uh, accessible through maybe conversation or meditation with the monk and uh, for the benefit of Li Shangjing. Third couplet. So the third couplet moves, as, as I said, away from what Li Shangjing is seeing towards what Li Shangjing is thinking, not, his, not seeing with the eyes of the face, but seeing with the eyes of the mind. I imagine him ringing the stone bell once at dusk, or leaning peacefully against his rattan staff. Being absent, the only way in which the monk can be made present is by imagining him, and being surrounded by the place where the monk lives, by his humble, uh, thatched hat. Uh, Li Shangjin tries to imagine what it is like to be that monk, what it is like to live the retired life. And this imagination basically coalesces, it crystallizes in two objects and two images. The first is that of a bell ringing at dusk. So Buddhist monks and Buddhist establishments uh, used bells, just like um, Christian monasteries did in the Middle Ages, as indicators of the passage of time, <coughs> like indicators of morning and of, of time to go to bed. And they also very quickly became, um, became a symbol for the transience, for the impermanence of all things. So Li Shangjing likes to imagine the monk ringing the stone bell. It's not a metal bell. This is you know, a rustic abode in the countryside. It's not a, a religious temple or an establishment, so it would have to make do with rudimentary instruments like stone bells. This same idea of rudimentary instruments comes in the next couplet. The, sorry, in the next line. In the first line, we get this image of the monk ringing the bell, which is an oral image, more than visual. In the second line, we get uh, a more visual image, the monk leaning peacefully against his rattan staff. Rattan must be cheap material that is, you know, fire, easy to find in the mountains, and that a monk would use for his walking staff. And he is leaning peacefully, because being a monk living the retired life, he would have peaceful thoughts and he would strive towards enlightenment and probably have already at least partially achieved it. Okay, finally, the last uh, couplet, which uh, summarizes the philosophical doctrine that uh, Li Shangjing has embedded, the religious message that he has absorbed just by being 
in the proximity of where this unnamed solitary monk dwells. The infinite universe is barely a speck of dust. So after all, what point to my petty loves and hates? This is a very common message in these poems. That is the irrelevance, the insignificance of one's worldly concerns, of one's worldly ambitions, when compared with uh, mm, the absolute truth of, 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 of enlightenment, any human ambition, any human knowledge, any human pursuit becomes negligible, absurd, insignificant. In, in fact, even the whole universe in the first hyperbolic image, the whole universe is just a speck of dust, insignificant. Uh, when we take into account the whole order of things. So, for example, in Buddhist cosmology, the infinity of worlds, the infinity of universes, the infinity of Buddhas, the almost infinite amount of time, present and past and future. So, all things lose their relevance in time, and especially in this big spatial and temporal framework. And, of course, if the whole universe is insignificant, how much more so the petty loves and hates, the, the emotions of a, a, a mode, a scholar official from a historical time and place. So that's it for today. Uh, quite a conventional piece, but I think it's relatively well developed. Not too much ambiguity. I would say, I, I read another version of this poem and the third couplet wasn't translated as an imagining of Li Shangjing's, it was rather translated as if Li Shangjing was the one doing those things. So in that translation it says, I ring the stone bell once at dusk, I lean peacefully against this rattan staff. I imagine both interpretations are perfectly valid, bearing in mind that uh, probably the original Chinese poem does not include uh, pronouns and the verb is ambiguous enough, or the verbs are ambiguous enough to be interpreted as mm, verbs of action or verbs of thinking or imagining. Perhaps there are other contextual clues or traditions of interpretation that would mm, forward the interpretation that uh, the translator Geoffrey Waters makes here. Anyway, quite a nice poem.